Umineko is known for many things, featuring one of the best and most memorable head-to-head -head battle of wits in the form of Battler vs. Beatrice, and methodically unspooling a beautiful and poignant tale of tragedy, rife with a cast as fantastically developed as they are deeply flawed and shackled by sin. But one of its more polarizing aspects is its subversive and highly metafictional handling of the murder mystery genre, infamously going so far as to withhold the answers to the all-important, all-encompassing question, who done it? And, as an addendum, how was it done, with respect to any of the game's copious murder puzzles? It's pretty obvious from the outset that the detective fiction slash murder mystery aspect of Umineko is an homage to what are known as Honkaku mysteries. Honkaku roughly translates to orthodox, and as a style, Honkaku was inspired by the fair play mysteries which flourished in the West's golden age of detective fiction, featuring the works of legendary authors such as Agatha Christie, Ellery Queen, S.S. Van Dyne, John Dixon Carr, and many, many more. While Umineko instead prefers to reference the Golden Age works and authors directly, the game is still very much a distillation of the Honkaku aesthetic, and its desire to take Honkaku to its logical extreme is what leads to the manifestation of Willard Wright's truths as not answers, but answer keys. In other words, the onus is on you, the reader, to deduce your way to the solution, and to use Willard's truths merely as a means to verify whether or not the solution you arrived at was the correct one. How effective the strategy ended up being is a hugely contentious and often heated point of discussion, though in fairness to Umineko, the game is, at its core, ostensibly much more about the why done it rather than the who or how done it, though I do personally wish this sentiment were more pronounced by not having so much of the central struggle of the question arcs revolve around Battler and Beatrice hashing out the nitty gritty of how the murders could have been carried out by a decidedly corporeal culprit. So in this video, I'll be breaking down each of Umineko's murders in detail or rather, in as much detail as can be gleaned from the crevices of the canon material. Fortunately, the manga adaptation of Willard and Claire's climactic showdown in Episode 7 does a much better job of exposing the truth, providing more context and an overall clearer and more concrete picture of the de facto solutions than the visual novel, especially in conjunction with the manga-exclusive Confessions of the Golden Witch interlude in Episode 8, which is told from the perspective of the mastermind themselves. I probably shouldn't have to say it, but this video is for those who have already completed Umineko, and by that I mean either the visual novel or manga, and not the anime, as that adaptation only covers the first half of Umineko, and in notoriously rushed fashion to boot. Additionally, I'll only be covering the murders from the question arcs. While I use the murders covered by Willard's Truths as a foundation, I will occasionally include murders that were not addressed as part of Willard's Truths if I feel they are relevant. In the spirit of the fair play detective paradigm, we start, as always, with some ground rules. Every game board involves the mastermind, Sayo Yasuda, acting with the aid of a number of accomplices. Since Yasu has access to Kinzo's overwhelming fortune, i.e. a vault full of golden ingots, buying the cooperation of any of the adults is a non-issue. Accomplice is a somewhat loose definition. The mastermind coerces others to partake in their scheme through a number of different methods. For instance, in one case, presenting the whole scenario as a fake murder mystery game for Battler to solve. Alternatively, the promise of a generous cut of Kinzo's inheritance is sometimes more than enough for the accomplices to play along with Yasu's script without further question. Regardless, Yasu tends to keep the true nature of the plan hidden from these extemporaneous accomplices, and they often wind up betrayed and killed by Yasu in the end. Conversely, a small number of the accomplices, most notably Genji, are what could be described as actual accomplices, who are privy to the true nature of Yasu's plan, and may even go as far as to carry out some of the killings on Yasu's behalf. Any murder where Sayo Yasuda is the culprit automatically implies that all of the servants are accomplices to varying degrees, as all servants are unwaveringly loyal to Yasu. Goda is occasionally included, but his role is generally minor, so whether or not he is an accomplice tends to be inconsequential. Any lies, deceptions, or depictions of magic or fantasy elements that are shown to the reader in the scenario proper are due to unreliable narration. All parties who are accomplices will witness the same false interpretation of the events and regard them as real. The one major exception, which unfortunately serves to confuse the situation horribly, is that those who are not accomplices but who are marked for death will also interpret the same false events as reality. So just as a universal rule, it is best to regard all testimony and narration as unreliable. The switchboard is disabled at some point before the first twilight, cutting off the phone line. Given that Yasu occasionally makes use of the phone to spook the survivors, it's likely that only the public line out to the mainland is disabled, leaving the private, internal lines intact. The 
第一のゲーム第一のゲーム演芸倉庫六人の死体 After a long evening of watching the would-be heirs to the Ushiromiya fortune squabble over who gets control of Kinzo's massive inheritance, the children, that is, Battler, Jessica, George, and Maria, return to the guest house, leaving the adults to continue bickering well into the wee hours of the morning. Natsuhi, weary of the arguing and having been taunted mercilessly by Ava, retires to her room for the night, hanging the scorpion charm she received from Jessica from her doorknob before she goes to bed. In the morning, Natsuhi awakens to find her door covered in bloody handprints. At the behest of Kanon, the adults race to the garden shed, discovering the seventh magic circle of the sun painted on the shutter. They open the shutter to find six corpses within, the bodies of Kraus, Rudolf, Rosa, Kyrie, Shannon, and Goda, their faces all horribly mutilated. There is only one red truth for this murder, confirming the identities of any unidentified corpses. The killer is Sayo Yasuda, with the accomplices being the servants, as well as Eva and Hideyoshi, who were bribed by Yasu at some point before the first twilight. Yasu's first intended victim is Natsuhi, but because of the scorpion charm on her door, Yasu is unable to enter because it would compromise the legend of the Golden Witch, thus rendering it impossible to pin the murders on Beatrice. Yasu instead takes advantage of the opportunity to reinforce the legend by splattering handprints on Natsuhi's door. Yasu then proceeds to the dining hall, where several of the adults are still gathered, and summarily executes them all, in addition to Goda, and moves their corpses to the garden shed. When the bodies are discovered in the morning, Shannon's corpse is only directly observed by Hideyoshi and Kanon, both of whom are accomplices, and the only direct testimony identifying the body is from Hideyoshi, which is, of course, a lie, as Kanon is still among the survivors. Claire confirms that the possibility that George may have insisted on seeing Shannon's body himself was an intentional risk taken by Yasu. The corpse that cannot return to Earth returns to illusions refers to Shannon's body being a lie. The most crucial element of this introductory murder, though not made clear to the reader at this point, is the concept of unreliable narration, that is, the deliberate misidentification of Shannon's corpse by Hideyoshi. The fact that testimony from an accomplice's perspective is shown to the reader to be genuine serves as the deceptive foundation for the vast majority of Umineko's puzzles going forward. After a falling out between Natsuhi and Eva suspecting each other of the Garden Shed Massacre, Eva and Hideyoshi return to their guest room until dinner, declaring that they'll be sure to lock the door to ensure their safety. When dinner time rolls around, Eva sends Genji and Kanon to the guest room, whereupon they find it locked, chained in place, with the letter jutting out from beneath the door, and no response. Genji runs off to inform Nanjo and Natsuhi, ordering Kanon to retrieve a bolt cutter to remove the chain. Upon returning only minutes later with Kumasawa, Kanon finds the first magic circle of the moon has inexplicably appeared on the door. Upon cutting the chain and entering, they find Eva and Hideyoshi dead, with stakes driven into their foreheads. The Red Truth serves two purposes, to confirm that the deaths were homicides and that they were carried out from within the room. The killer is Sayo Yasuda. Yasu, as Kanon, convinces Eva or Hideyoshi to unlock the door, as there is no reason for either of them to distrust him. Yasu then enters, kills them, arranges their bodies, then orders Genji to cut the chain and falsely corroborate that it had been set when they first arrived at the room. Beatrice's letter could have been placed at any time by either of them, and similarly, the symbol could have been drawn on the door at any time. A chain of illusions can only trap illusions refers to the chain being set purely by the testimony of Kanon, Genji, and Kumasawa, all of whom were accomplices. This one is fairly self-explanatory, as in episode 5, Kinzo is confirmed to have been dead long before the events of the Rokenjima conference, with his body preserved in the mansion. He is only seen to be alive in the eyes of the servants, as well as Natsuhi and Kraus, who are also privy to Kinzo's death. Let the man of illusions go to where he belongs, refers to Kinzo being among the dead before the conference even started. Lured by a foul stench emanating from the basement, as well as the sound of a door closing, Conan rushes to investigate the boiler room, where he spots a shimmering golden butterfly, indicating the presence of the golden witch, Beatrice. Challenging the witch to show herself, Conan is impaled by a stake which materializes out of nowhere, slicing through the darkness and striking him in the chest. In a fit of rage, he pulls out the stake and collapses, bleeding out on the boiler room floor, where he is found by the rest of the survivors. 
The red truth confirms the alibis of all survivors, as well as the fact that Kanon neither died by his own hand nor in an accident. As Kanon's identity is that of the mastermind, Sayo Yasuda, this entire incident is a fabrication. Kanon fakes his injury through the use of good old-fashioned fake blood and coordinates with Dr. Nanjo beforehand to ensure that Nanjo is in charge of tending to Kanon's wounds and proceeds to give a false account of his death to the survivors. The witch and stake of illusions can pierce not but illusions refers to Kanon's death being a lie, something corroborated by the Red Truce as none of them ever confirmed that Kanon is actually dead. This is the first murder to double down on false testimony by showing supernatural elements as the direct cause of the murder, something that frequently recurs with future cases. As far as fair play challenges go, this is by far the fairest shenaniganry to see through if you are industriously playing detective. In fact, simply reaching the conclusion that the Red Truths don't ever confirm Kanon's death would give you a pretty solid suspect for the mastermind for the remainder of the game. All survivors gather in Kinzo's study, as that is the only room within the mansion that the servants' master keys are unable to unlock. While Jessica, Battler, George, and Natsuhi are examining the portrait of Beatrice, Maria draws their attention to a letter which has appeared seemingly out of nowhere on the table behind them. Natsuhi, suspicious of everyone aside from those gathered around the portrait, kicks Genji, Kumasawa, Nanjo, and Maria out of the study. Battler leaves Maria with the scorpion charm before she leaves. Time passes and the phone in the study suddenly rings, shocking everyone as they believed all the phone lines to have been cut. From the receiver comes Maria's voice, singing along to a haunting melody. The four of them immediately rush to the parlor, where they are greeted with a nightmarish and spine-chilling crime scene. Genji, Kumasawa, and Nanjo all dead, impaled with stakes, with Maria facing the wall, singing calmly to herself. The Red Truth serves to absolve Maria and the three victims of carrying out the crime, and confirm that the deaths were indeed homicides. The killer is Sayo Yasuda, who enters the room under the guise of Beatrice and instructs Maria to face the wall and fabricate a story about the room being locked when asked. Yasu then kills the three servants, sparing Maria to keep the story of the scorpion charm consistent, and places the call to the study, holding the receiver next to Maria. Yasu could have entered and left at any time using either Kanon or Shannon's master key to unlock and relock the door. Illusions are the blind girl's song. Illusions of a closed room suggests that Yasu, as Beatrice, convinced Maria to lie on her behalf, once again creating a room locked by testimony alone. To round out the first game board, Natsuhi is lured out to the mansion's foyer in front of the golden Beatrice portrait by a letter challenging her to one final face-off. Natsuhi raises her gun at an unknown figure, shown to the reader as a silhouette of the Golden Witch herself. A gunshot rings out throughout the mansion, and as Battler, George, and Jessica race to the scene, they find Natsuhi's body, crumpled on the floor, a fresh, fatal bullet wound in the middle of her forehead. The Red Truth confirms that Natsuhi was indeed shot and killed by an unknown perpetrator, despite there being no survivors aside from those with ironclad alibis. Unbeknownst to Natsuhi, the gun that she had been carrying and brandishing for the majority of the day had been emptied beforehand, containing only traces of gunpowder and no bullets. Thus, pulling the trigger only produced a harmless puff of gunpowder. Of course, the one who had ensured Natsuhi's gun was emptied, and the wielder of the actual firearm that buried a bullet in Natsuhi's forehead, is the mastermind, Sayo Yasuda. Beatrice appears in the flesh for the first time, witnessed by Maria and Rosa in the Rose Garden. She gives Maria a sealed envelope, which is eventually passed on to Rosa and retires to the guest room, where she is witnessed by Kyrie as she is being escorted. Later in the evening, once all the children have turned in for the night, this flesh and blood Beatrice gathers all adults in the chapel, likely using gold ingots from the vault as both a lure and as proof of her identity as the current heir to Kinzo's fortune. The adults are last seen unanimously acknowledging her status as the Golden Witch. The following morning, Genji awakens Rosa and informs her that the rest of the adults are missing, and that the chapel door is locked and bears the seventh circle of the sun, the same mysterious symbol from the previous game board. Shannon was directed to the chapel by a letter found in the dining hall earlier in the morning. Rosa was awakened as the only key that will unlock the chapel is in her possession, sealed in the envelope given to Maria by Beatrice on the previous day. 
Upon unlocking the chapel, they are greeted by another sickeningly skin-crawling spectacle. A feast of the damned, if you will. Krauss, Natsuki, Eva, Hideyoshi, Rudolph, and Kirie, all dead around a dining table, with their innards exposed and spilling out all over the floor. Since this is an absurd amount of red truths, I'll condense things a bit. They confirm that the deaths were homicides, that the chapel can only be opened with the chapel key, and that once Rosa took the envelope containing the chapel key from Maria, she had held possession of it ever since. The killer is Sayo Yasuda, with Rosa acting as the primary accomplice, likely bribed by Yasu's gold. Rosa's accomplice status is hinted at early on as she perceives Beatrice performing magic and testifies as much to the rest of the adults. Yasu, appearing in person disguised as Beatrice, invites all the adults to the chapel, where she has everyone partake in a celebratory toast, with drinks that had been laced with a lethal poison from Nanjo's medical supplies, save for, of course, Rosa. None of the Red Truths ever confirmed the chapel door to be locked, instead exasperatingly confirming the qualities of the chapel door if it were locked. As Rosa, Genji, Kanon, and Shannon are all accomplices, their accounts of the morning after are not but a fabrication. It's true that the key and the envelope never left Rosa's hands from the moment she received them, but since the chapel door was never locked to begin with, the key is itself completely irrelevant. The gold truth locks the lock of illusions is fairly self-explanatory. Flying into a rage after witnessing the gruesome aftermath of her parents' murder, Jessica attempts to confront Beatrice face to face, only to find the guest room locked and the witch nowhere to be found. Kanon consoles Jessica and offers to look after her himself, taking her back to her room. An extended magical showdown between Kanon and Beatrice breaks out, ending in Kanon and Jessica's demise. The survivors, led by a now armed Rosa, hold an impromptu all hands, only to find Jessica and Kanon missing. They rush to Jessica's room only to find it locked and the first magic circle of the moon drawn on the door. Upon using a master key to unlock the door, they find Jessica's body on the floor with a stake buried in her back. Since Jessica's room key is also in the room, only the servants, all of whom hold their own copy of the master key, could have carried out the murder. Kanon's master key is found in Jessica's pocket with Kanon himself nowhere to be found. The Red Truth confirms Jessica and Kanon's death in Jessica's room, as well as the fact that the only way to lock the door is either with Jessica's key or with one of the servant's master keys. The killer is Sayo Yasuda, acting under the guise of Kanon. Kanon kills Jessica, then Yasu wills her Kanon persona out of existence completely, causing him to be considered killed off. Yasu then places Kanon's master key inside Jessica's pocket and leaves the room. Any of the servants, including Yasu, could have locked the door from the outside using their own master key. Yasu, of course, possesses two master keys, one for Shannon and one for Kanon, so leaving one of them behind with Jessica is a non-issue. Illusions who have fulfilled their role do not even leave a corpse behind refers to Kanon's existence being incorporeal, as he is merely a persona of Yasu, thus his death leaves behind no trace. George, Shannon, and Goda visit the chapel to retrieve the key to Natsuhi's room from her corpse to search for anything that might be able to vanquish the Golden Witch. Beatrice suddenly appears in a swarm of golden butterflies, chasing all of them back to Natsuhi's room where another supernatural skirmish breaks out. Meanwhile, Rosa, Maria, and Battler, who have holed up in the parlor, are summoned by Genji. As they wonder where everyone else has disappeared to, Genji informs them that the remainder of the group left to search Natsuhi's room. The door to Natsuhi's room is found covered in blood, and inside are the bodies of George, Shannon, and Goda. The Red Truth serves to confirm that Natsuhi's room was indeed a locked room, and that Rosa had been in possession of all the servants' master keys the entire time. The killer is Sayo Yasuda, this time under the guise of Shannon. Goda, George, and Shannon make their way, key in hand, from the chapel to Natsuhi's room. Once inside, Shannon kills both Goda and George, smears blood on the outside of the door, locks it from the inside, then orchestrates her own death. She starts by placing a stake on the dresser next to where her body would collapse, making it seem as if she had been impaled like Goda and George, but that the stake had fallen out on its own. Then rigs a mechanism whereby after the gun fires to kill her, it is propelled behind the dresser, out of sight, by the force of the recoil. As the survivors are thoroughly rattled by this point, no one bothers to go searching for a weapon hidden in the room. No one would dispute that a coffin is a closed room implies that Shannon was the killer, locking the door from the inside before orchestrating her own demise. Five. 
For the final murders of the second game board, earlier on in the night, Kumasawa and Nanjo are seen by Genji and Gota to be killed in the servants' quarters by Kanon, who has seemingly risen from the dead. Once the rest of the survivors are informed, they race to the servants' quarters, only to find telltale bloodstains, with the bodies nowhere to be found. When Genji summons Rosa, Maria, and Battler from the parlor, he reports that he's found Nanjo and Kumasawa's bodies, which have mysteriously turned up in the courtyard. There are a smattering of red truths which accompany this murder, but none of them confirm that Kumasawa and Nanjo were actually killed in the servants' quarters. No illusion can create a corpse refers to the fact that they were not killed by the seemingly reanimated canon, as that entire story was a fabrication agreed upon beforehand by the servants. Instead, the two were killed by Genji. Genji is privy to the true nature of Yasu's game, thus he is instructed to dispatch both Kumasawa and Nanjo on Yasu's behalf. As the servants have no alibis, Genji could have killed them at any time they were out of sight of Rosa's group. The adults spend all night arguing in the dining room, as usual, additionally discussing the possible existence of a 19th person on the island, Kinzo's unseen mistress, Beatrice. The following morning, they find an awful stench permeating the mansion, emanating from the boiler room. A call for the servants yields no reply, and a search of the mansion reveals several doors around the mansion to be locked, bearing the seventh circle symbol. An inspection of the master key box reveals that only the keys to each of the sealed rooms are missing. Rudolph breaks into one of the locked rooms, the parlor, from the outside window and discovers Shannon's body, impaled with a stake with an envelope next to her. Inside the envelope is the key to the second floor guest room. The guest room contains Kumasawa's body, with an envelope containing a key to the third floor waiting room. The waiting room contains Goda's body, with a key to the second floor VIP guest room. That room contains Genji's body, with a key to the boiler room, where Kinzo's charred corpse is found, alongside a key to the chapel. Finally, inside the chapel lies Kanan's body, with a key to the parlor, creating a deranged and ostentatious topological nightmare, a closed loop composed of an interconnection of six closed rooms. The Red Truth confirms the nature of the locked room circle configuration, and the fact that each servant was in possession of their own master key when found. Battler's initial theory, which Beatrice is convinced to not refute, is that the culprit killed all the servants, then fell victim to one of their own traps and perished in an accident. However, this ends up being far from the truth. Sometime in the night, Yasu kills Genji, Gota, and Kumasawa, moving their corpses to the rooms where they are eventually found, and locking the doors with one of their two master keys. Yasu then adopts the guise of Shannon and fakes her death in the parlor, locking the door from the inside, having coordinated with Nanjo beforehand as usual to ensure that he is the only one to examine her body. Additionally, Yasu deliberately places Shannon in the parlor to ensure that she is the first corpse discovered, as the parlor is easily accessible from a first floor window, whereas all the other rooms are located on higher floors and thus nowhere near as accessible from the outside. This gives Yasu ample time to change into the guise of Kanon, run to the chapel, lock it from the inside, and play the part of Kanon's corpse. As in the second game board, the key to this trick lies with Yasu killing off both the Shannon and Kanon personas once they are no longer needed. In the closed room ring, the end and the beginning overlap refers to Yasu playing the part of both Kanon and Shannon to begin and end the cycle of the six locked rooms. Since Ava successfully solves the epitaph after this point, Yasu's plan is crucially diverted from its traditional course, though Yasu remains present and plays a minor role going forward in the scenario. Because it's left ambiguous as to whether or not Yasu knows that Eva had successfully laid claim to the inheritance, it's quite difficult to figure out what Yasu's motives are for any of the actions carried out by their hand going forward. As an example, the stakes that end up implanted in any of the corpses are generally agreed to be the work of Yasu, without any clear explanation as to why. Though a common theory points to Yasu's desire to stay the course of the epitaph due to the lack of awareness of it having been solved by Eva. After Eva successfully solves the epitaph, making her the rightful heir to Kinzo's inheritance, she is confronted by Rosa, who arrives mere minutes later after solving the epitaph herself. The two quarrel over splitting the inheritance, but ultimately call a momentary truce. Sometime later, Eva, claiming to be stricken with fever, retires to her room with Hideyoshi, while Rosa and Maria head out to the Rose Garden in search of Maria's missing Rose. The fantasy interpretation sees them both brutally and sadistically murdered by Eva Beatrice, and their bodies are later found in the Rose Garden. 
no falsehoods in their final moments as told, reveals that the fantasy interpretation is an almost one-for-one -one interpretation of the actual events, with Ava confronting Rosa in the Rose Garden, likely to resume the dispute about the rightful owner of Kinzo's inheritance. An altercation breaks out, and Rosa ends up impaled on the fence, either by accident or as part of a struggle with Ava. Maria is then strangled to death by Ava as a witness. Kyrie, Rudolph, and Hideyoshi voluntarily leave the safety of the guest house for the mansion to retrieve food for the survivors. The fantasy interpretation is that they are all ambushed and killed by Ava Beatrice, the Seven Stakes, and the Chiester sisters in the mansion's foyer. No falsehoods in their final moments as told implies, once again, that the fantasy interpretation matches the actual sequence of events. The killer is either Ava or Hideyoshi. As evidenced by the Red Truce, Kyrie and Rudolph's desire to visit the mansion was a ruse to corner Hideyoshi alone. Kyrie is suspicious of Ava's alibi due to the fresh cigarette remains in the ashtray, implying that Ava, who can't stand smoke, had not remained in her room the entire time Rosa and Maria were in the Rose Garden, as she had claimed, and that Hideyoshi was covering for her. Thus, Kyrie decides to take matters into her own hands by confronting Hideyoshi at the mansion. Upon reaching the mansion's foyer, Rudolph and Kyrie are attacked by Ava and Hideyoshi and fight back in their dying moments, dealing a fatal injury to Hideyoshi, who shields Ava from Kyrie's final parting gift. This is likely why Ava specifically calls for Dr. Nanjo upon returning to the guest house when rallying the survivors to the mansion. Battler, Jessica, Nanjo, and Ava leave the safety of the guest house in search of Jessica's parents. They find Natsuhi and Kraus strangled to death and impaled in the courtyard. The obvious culprit wields a mutable blade, implies that the killer is the most obvious suspect, Ava. Before Ava returns to her room for the evening, she goes to the kitchen to brew some coffee for herself and offers to prepare some for Kraus and Natsuhi. Ava laces the coffee with either Rosa's sedatives, which she uses to quell Maria's tantrums, or tranquilizers from Najo's medical supplies, causing Kraus and Natsuhi to fall unconscious, making them easy targets for strangulation. This brings us to Episode 3's Endgame. Proceeding into the mansion, the survivors find a freshly painted sequence of numbers on the door to the parlor. Barging into the room, they find George's body on the ground, next to Shannon. Later, an altercation breaks out between Jessica and Ava, with Jessica blaming Ava for the death of her parents, ending with Ava's gun inadvertently firing and temporarily blinding Jessica. Nanju treats Jessica, but is confronted by Ava Beatrice, who kills him on the spot. The killer for these two murders is Sayo Yasuda. Yasu easily lures George to the parlor under the guise of Shannon, who, to him, had seemingly risen from the dead, and kills him. Yasu then returns to playing the part of Shannon's corpse in the parlor. Once Nanjo tends to Jessica, Yasu confronts, shoots, and kills Nanjo, with the mystery surrounding his death serving as the final battle between Ava Beatrice and Battler to round out the scenario. The final episode of the question arcs is a doozy, as the majority of it centers on a seemingly interminable sequence of otherworldly events involving Gop, the Ghost Servants, the Chiester Sisters, Ronave, Virgilia, you name it, and witnessed by almost everyone on the island, thus making it extremely difficult for the reader to deny the involvement of supernatural beings. The reality is, however, that most of what is shown to the reader is a complete falsification, thus making it very difficult to piece together the overall trajectory of events that take place, as Battler only ever happens upon the grisly aftermath of the massacre, discovering the bodies of his relatives scattered all over the estate as he wearily wanders the grounds and through the mansion itself. Kinzo appears to all the adults in the dining hall on the first night. He summons the Chiester sisters who execute Rudolph, Ava, Rosa, Natsuhi, Hideyoshi, and Genji on the spot. The truth is that Yasu buys the cooperation of, at the minimum, Kraus and Kyrie. The manga states that everyone besides Battler was bribed by Yasu, but considering that most of the adults meet their demise during the first twilight anyway, it doesn't end up making too much of a difference. In reality, the victims were called together, and Yasu simply executes them where they sit with the help of Genji. It is likely that the so-called survivors of the dining room massacre were never actually present, and were thus ignorant to the true nature of Yasu's plan. Everything that transpires from this point forward, such as the imprisonment of the servants, Kyrie and Kraus, and their subsequent nail-bitingly suspenseful escape sequence, is a complete fabrication. Jessica and George are confronted one-on-one -on -one by Yasu, acting as both Kanon and Shannon. 
George is summoned to the Rose Garden where he is killed by Yasu as Shannon, and Jessica is killed in her room by Yasu as Kanon. Before Jessica is executed, Kanon has her place a call to Battler and fabricate the fantastical testimony about the killers being demons. Yasu then proceeds to kill off both Kanon and Shannon as personas, then confronts and kills Nanjo, Kraus, and Kyrie. Kyrie's final call to Battler is either under duress at gunpoint, or Kyrie acting in accordance with the murder mystery game script devised by Yasu. While this is all happening, Kumasawa and Gota have been locked up in the garden shed, holding the key to the shed's shutter from within. At some point, Yasu approaches the garden shed and asks for the key from Gota through the same window that Battler handed Gota the key in the first place. Yasu unlocks the shed, shoots them both, hangs their bodies, and locks the shutter. The key that Yasu leaves in Gota's pocket is fake, a random key with the garden shed tag on it. Finally, Yasu poisons Maria, likely under the guise of Beatrice, as she can pretty much convince Maria to do anything when appearing as the Golden Witch. Yasu then burns the already dead Kinzo's corpse in the furnace as always, adopts the appearance of Shannon, and stages Shannon's corpse in a manner similar to Episode 2, having placed a stake on the ground next to where she would collapse, and threading the barrel of the gun through one of the narrow openings of the Grate of the Well, such that it would drop inside once her hand went limp after pulling the trigger. Both this line stating that everyone had been arranging the same story beforehand, as well as all three of Willard's truths, point to the whole of Episode 4 being one big charade, with everyone playing an assigned role as they were slowly picked off one by one by the mastermind, Sayo Yasuda.